And now let's talk about status. Remember now when you're presenting briefs and motions, the subject or the object, I shouldn't say subject, but the object is <clears throat> to present an issue, argue the issue, present reasons why you're right, and to support the reasons why you're right with quotations from recognized authorities. Recognized authorities could be Bouvier's Law Dictionary, could be Black's Law Dictionary, it can be court decisions, etc. But I always use the Supreme Court of the United States, and I don't think that you're going to find a dozen cases cited that are not out of the Supreme Court of the United States in any of the paper that you receive from us. We want it right from the horse's mouth, and I wouldn't know the law except that I'd gotten it from the Supreme Court of the United States. And when we're talking about the subject here, this jurisdiction brief, status and support of demand for dismissal, I went right to the Supreme Court. Now let's listen to what the Supreme Court has to say about jurisdiction pursuant to status. A country consists of its citizenry, or in the case of the United States, the sovereign people. We're claiming that the people are sovereign, not the government. The Russian government is sovereign in the Soviet Union, but in the United States of America, pursuant to our Constitution, the people are sovereign, but they have given up their sovereignty for privilege. Sovereignty itself is, of course, not subject to the law. Well, there goes your statement. If sovereignty isn't subject to the law, then non-sovereignty is subject to the law. And so for all of you non-sovereign persons out there, you are subject to all of these rules and regulations. So what you're going to need to do then is to regain your sovereignty. Sovereignty isn't subject to the law, for it is the author and source of the law. But in our system, while some sovereign powers are delegated to the agencies of the government, sovereignty itself remains with the people by whom and for whom all government exists and acts. And the law is the definition and the limitation of power. That comes from Yick Woe versus Hopkins Sheriff, 188 U.S. 356. Didn't you think that was First Gordon 414? No, I tell you, friends, there aren't any original thoughts that come out of my brain. I told you before, I'm like Thomas Edison. It's the Supreme Court of the United States that tells you what sovereignty is. Now, whether or not you're sovereign, a sovereign citizen with the highest political, judicial, and economic rights available to a man who's free depends upon your status. And you'll find that in this case called Yick Wo versus Hopkins. Now, if you don't have that case, then go to your law library and pull that case out and read it. Now let's discuss. Let's look at. You see what I'm doing here? I'm going into this inferior court here in Ada County, and I'm saying, look at what the Supreme Court has to say about George Gordon, who claims to be a sovereign and a free man, Judge. I had a judge tell me the other day that I was forcing him to blow dust off of leather-bound volumes that hadn't been read for many years. Yeah, that's right. This is a pretty old case, and I want that judge to go out there and read it. Because since 1933, we don't have or haven't had very many sovereign citizens in the state of Idaho. But they're looking at one here. And they're looking at a whole lot more sovereign citizens in the state of Idaho than they've been looking at here for many, many years. In discussing the excesses of government, the Supreme Court was talking about a government of laws and not men when it stated, for the very idea that one man may be compelled to hold any material right essential to the enjoyment of life at the mere will of another seems to be intolerable in any country where freedom prevails as being the essence of slavery itself. Well, when the man comes out and says, I'm going to look at your house, and if you've got a building permit, and I'm going to look in your walls, and I'm the electrical inspector, or I'm the plumbing inspector, and I'm the building inspector, that is the very essence of slavery itself. How did you degenerate into a status or a capacity or an incapacity, I should say, where you have subjected yourself to this kind of tyranny? How did it happen to us? The will of another in these cases is simply too much government. 
And when government starts regulating our lives, prohibiting what we cannot do, commanding what we can do, not what we will do, and punishing us when no real crime has been committed. I've seen people in our county here go to jail for not having building permits and plumbing and electrical permits, etc. Then, as stated by the High Court, the government has placed the people in the essence of slavery itself. Well, I'll tell you this, boy, there's a lot of people in the essence of slavery here in Idaho. The sovereign people of a country consists of its citizenry, individuals, or natural free persons. Got that? Natural free persons. Put another way, a citizen is a constituent member of the sovereignty, synonymous with the people in 19 How 40. A citizen is the term used to describe the highest status obtainable by a person within a country. A citizen is a free and natural person having and enjoying all of his inalienable political and civil rights within a country. However, there are other statuses of persons within a country, and this country consists of a citizenry with wide and diversified status. Status relates to a citizen's particular position in relation to the rest of the people. A man's status is his position as a lawful man. When you walk into that courtroom, one of the first things that a court of competent jurisdiction is going to determine is who just walked in here, the sovereign or the serf. And once they've determined you're a serf, it isn't necessary to have common law. I walked into court not long ago with a fellow who had a divorce case, and he'd already signed all the divorce papers and one thing and another, but he hadn't paid the alimony and child support. <clears throat> and he came into the school, and he said, Now, how can I, you know, they want to collect $36,000 from me in these back payments. How can I avoid paying this 36000 That's a good question, because do you see what he's done to himself? He signed the contract. When I was in the hospital, I didn't sign the contract. They don't have any jurisdiction over me. Are they going to sue me to collect? How can they sue me to collect? Remember, I was compelled in there against my will. Somebody put a gun called Statute of Idaho, held it up to my head and said, here's what you're going to do. You're going to come in and avail yourself of our services. You're going to bring your car into our garage and we're going to fix it. So after he got the car fixed, I just said, who's going to pay for this? Well, you are. Why? Well, because, uh, oh, you didn't sign the contract. No. It's that contract that gets you in trouble every time. Stop signing contracts and you can get your sovereignty back. And that's what your courts are telling you. There was a fellow over in Denver. He was an interesting fellow, and the IRS had come into his little store over there, and he'd written three or four books and been in court two or three times and lost every time. And the key thing that I learned from that man's experience was a judge that leaned over the bench and said, why don't you get out of the bank? What a clue that was. You know, that's a little more judicial discretion than the judge was ever obligated to give. The judge understood the money system. Here's a guy with checking accounts and credit cards, and here he is, a surf on the land. The IRS comes in and regulates his business, tells him when to come in and go out, like Yick Woe versus Sheriff. And the guy screaming constitutional rights, and the judge looks at him and says, if you get out of the banking system, you probably won't have this kind of problem. I don't have any problem with my IRS. They don't make any claims upon me, and I don't have any trouble from my state tax commission. I'm a unique person, you know. I don't pay any property tax, and I don't pay any taxes to speak of, and I don't pay any income tax. I don't have any income. The IRS isn't after me. I'm not filling out Fifth Amendment returns. And I eat three squares a day and live in a house, and the roof keeps the rain off me. And I think that's pretty much what everybody wants. But my status is correct. And my position when I walk in on the courtroom floor is something different than all the rest of the sheeple who walk up before the judge. The sovereign people of a country, this is page two, now I'm at the top of the page, consists of its citizenry. Individuals are natural free persons. Now, Going down here to the middle, I, I've already read that. Let's take a look at status relates to a citizen's particular position in relation to the rest of the people. A man's status is his position as a lawful man. My position and status is something different than other persons out there. That's why when I walk in the courtroom, 
there's something new, strange, and unique about this man. And there's a lot of free men in this county, and when they walk in the courtroom, you can tell right away that there's something about that fellow that isn't the same as with these other people. For example, a man may have the status of a member, that is, an individual who belongs to a firm, partnership, company, or corporation, or the like. Black's Law Dictionary, page 887. Such persons have legal rights, liabilities, and therefore fall under various jurisdictions of the courts. A member then has a lesser status than a free and natural person because he has accepted some privileges of which subject him to more regulation and restriction within the society than the free and natural person. So you got a free and natural person up here, then you got a member down here. A man can also be a subject, that is, one who owes allegiance to a sovereign and is governed by his, that is, the sovereign's laws. That legislature is the sovereign over the bank, and the bank holds the mortgage on your house, and you then are the subject of your sovereign legislature. Black, page 1277. A subject is also a status of an individual member of a nation who is subject to the laws of the sovereign. Subject, therefore, is a wider term than citizen. There are members of a state who, by reason of natural or conventional disability, do not enjoy full political rights, and therefore the word subject is used in contradistinction to the word citizen, which is a word describing one of the sovereign people, a person who has full political rights. So the subject is someone that doesn't have full political rights. He doesn't have all that the natural citizen has. Every full citizen is a person. Okay, so citizens, members, subjects, etc. are all persons. Corporations, trusts, association, foundation, unions, trade associations, those are persons under the law. Partnerships, persons. Natural persons, citizens are persons. So person is a broad term. But being a specific person within that broad term determines what your legal status is and therefore the jurisdiction of the court that you're walking into. Boy, let me tell you, when I walk into a small claims court, that's assuming that I would walk into one. You've got a different type of circumstance than the average tenant relationship with his uh, landlord. Sovereignty to me is a pretty important thing. When I sign a contract, I want to read the whole thing. Wait till we talk about service of process. Every full citizen is a person. Other human beings, namely subjects who are not citizens, may be persons. But not every human being is necessarily a person, for a person is capable of rights and duties, and there may well be human beings having no legal rights, as was the case with slaves in English law. Beauvier, page 2575. And today, we have numerous classes of juristic persons, subjects and members. Look up the word slave, and it's kind of an amazing term. Slave had no property rights whatsoever, not even, even in his own life. Well, there can be no doubt that the movement of our so-called progressive society has been from status to contract. Maine, uh, Law, page 170. Status determines a man's position in relation to the rest of the population, whereas contract, denotes the degree of subjugation to which a person has placed himself into society as a juristic person. Now, <clears throat> a policeman or a public servant who wants to be a public servant, a man who runs for public office, he becomes a servant or a subject, and he gives up sovereignty to do that, and he gets certain privileges for doing that. And there may be a reason why you would want to do that. I'm not saying that becoming a corporation or... You know, you want to become a doctor. Well, let me tell you, when you become a doctor, you're going to be subjected to all of the rules and regulations of the legislature because it's one of the regulated professions. And so you're going to have to decide whether or not you want the police powers to rule over you. If it doesn't bother you, then go ahead and do it. But if it bothers you, maybe you better look for some other profession. As the majority of the population in this country has moved from a state of high status as free and natural persons to one of socialism, welfareism, and the like, our society has moved from one of free persons to one of contract, sacrificing some of their freedoms for security, limited liability, and the like, which generally demands of them some specific performance. Go sign up for food stamps and find out if there's any specific performance. 
sign up for welfare and find out what the terms of the contract require of you in specific performance. I mean, all these welfare schemes are designed to subjugate people to some form of slavery. Now, if you want the government to become your sovereign master and to support and take care of you, you've degenerated then to the status of a 10-year-old. No, I've got a little 10-year-old girl. I tell her when to come in and when to go out. I feed her and clothe her and house her and give her her spending money, and I tell her how to spend her money. I tell her how to eat. I tell her how to hold her fork. I tell her how to dress. I tell her when to dress. I tell her when to go to bed. If you want, if that doesn't bother you, well, then go sign up for food stamps and welfare and all the rest of the goodies and the benefits that go with it. Look, being a slave isn't necessarily all bad, wicked, terrible, and evil. But my little girl doesn't come to me and scream rights. She doesn't have any rights. She has privileges and equity. And that's all that our society has done. We've moved from our status and responsibility of taking care of ourselves and being adults to that of being children. And our sovereign parent, the government, tells us how to behave and why we should behave that way. And they punish us when we don't behave that way. And then when we go into the courts, the court says, hold it, your status is wrong. You're a 10-year-old kid, so therefore you don't have any rights. And then we throw a temper tantrum and kick and scream and have a fit. Most individuals within this country have moved so far from their honored status as a free person to contract that these juristic persons, are, st as stated in Yik Wo, are living in the essence of slavery itself. My little girl lives in the essence of slavery. Status at times has yielded to contract, but status itself cannot be reduced to contract. That's important, friend. You know, <clears throat> you can yield your status to contract, but no one can compel you to. You can w line up at the bank and you can turn your gold in and give up your sovereign property rights to the gold to the banker, but he can't compel you to do that, and they didn't compel you to do that. They just passed a law and said, this is the law and you have to obey it. And everybody went out and obeyed it. But listen, when a black woman was sitting on that bus in Birmingham, Alabama, and said, this black woman is not going to ride the back of the bus, she was exercising her rights and duties as a sovereign citizen. That law doesn't apply to me. Contract has also made numerous attacks on property, which is rights. And this word property and rights are synonymous terms. Do you know your rights are property that you own and can't be taken away from you? You can give them away, you can waive your rights, but they cannot be taken from you by force and violence. You have to give them up. You have to go sign something. You know, if you could just learn to stop signing things, you'd become a free man accidentally over a period of years, which have been repeatedly repulsed. The original associations of status have been so well preserved that contracts may not alter its incidence or nature. This person is not limited by contract and enjoys the highest status a citizen can enjoy, that of a free and natural citizen. A person has the status of a citizen not because he is human, but because rights and duties are ascribed to him. You bet. When I drive my car down the road, I'm responsible for my actions. I used to be able to go into Pengillies and drink six and drive home drunk because... The insurance company was responsible for my actions, but now I don't have an insurance, so I don't have an insurance company who is now my master. I'm responsible for my actions, and I don't want to harm or hurt someone else. So what I have to do is I have to stop drinking, or I have to drink and then take yellow cab home. That's what that boils down to. See, I have the responsibility over myself now. The person is the legal substance of which rights and duties are attributes. An individual human being considered as having such attributes is what lawyers call a natural person. Free man is a word used to describe a person with the status of a free and natural citizen who freely exercises all of his political, economic, civil, and personal rights, liberties, duties, and capacities. Among those inalienable rights is the right to property, which is actually an aggregate of rights which are guaranteed by the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States. And it's protected by government and includes such things as money and a common law action. 
Property is the right of any person to possess, use, enjoy, and dispose of a thing, and that includes rights. You know, people can dispose of their rights, but they have to do it voluntarily. All free and natural citizens, free men, have the inalienable right to freedom and personal liberty. You know, I go by the term free man, and my government, you know, sometimes these government agents and judges, are you a free man? Absolutely. Are you a constitutionalist? Aren't you? They're using the word constitutionalist around here in a, in a lesser uh, form than a communist. I think a communist has a higher status among our, uh, some of our lower judges and policemen around my local area, I don't know about yours, but in our local area, than does um, a constitutional or free man. In other words, they look upon us as being something wicked, terrible, bad, and evil. Well, it's certainly true we are peculiar. I mean, when I walk into the courtroom, everybody... Uh, will recognize almost immediately if there's something about this fellow that's strange and we don't understand that. But I'm a free man, and I'm a free man by definition because I'm not accepting privilege. I don't live on food stamps and welfare, and I don't pay taxes, and I don't have any specific duty to perform for my government. Now, people sometimes say, well, you should. All the rest of us do. Well... If all the rest of you want to, you certainly are free to do that. But I can't be compelled into paying taxes and becoming another slave or a serf like all the rest of you people against my will and over my objection. And I've decided for myself that I really don't want to pay the income tax. And I really don't want to drive on my roads with the government's permission. I want to drive on my road without anybody's permission. And I think you should drive on your roads without anyone's permission. And I don't think you should pay income tax unless you want to or unless you're acting in some privileged capacity and you owe it. All right, I'm going to stop here on this subject matter of status. You can read the rest of this yourself and you can certainly pick up Yick Woe versus Sheriff and you can uh, uh, study these at length in your spare time. And I want to... Uh, point out to you that from now on we're going to start moving pretty fast and furiously and we're going to be using words, terms, phrases, and legal terms uh, as if you were a lawyer and as if you knew and understood these terms. Don't get left behind. When you see a word like chosen action or inland bill of exchange, capacity and incapacity and idiot and etc., if you don't understand what those words mean in legal terminology, stop Get the dictionary out and look it up. Because when you get into that courtroom, what you may believe a word to mean because of its use in the vernacular on the street and what the court believes that word means and the way they're going to use it can be and often is two totally separate meanings. And I mean that seriously. When you get into that courtroom, you got a new language. Now, it's not so new or bizarre that you cannot learn it. But you cannot take this lightly and just walk into the courtroom and flippantly stand up and say, let me tell you what I think about this because I think this is fair and, or unfair and, and I think that the court should uh, take consideration of me because, you know, I've got a good excuse for driving down the road without a license because I didn't have any gold or silver to buy a license and therefore I think the court should dismiss this case. You go in there arguing like that and they're going to say, uh-huh. Yeah, here's another fool, here's another slave coming in here trying to argue money, and he doesn't even understand the definition of some of these terms he's using. Now, the terms and definitions are laid out for you. It's up to you now to educate yourself as we go along, lesson by lesson, so that when we get to the end of this, when you walk into that courtroom, you know and you understand the subject matter. And when that judge says, what do you mean, counsel? You sit there and say, counsel by the Supreme Court's definition in Powell versus Alabama, Your Honor. And I'm not here to request it and ask it. I'm here as a belligerent claimant and person to demand my right to counsel. And if you deny it, you deny yourself the jurisdiction with which to try this case. Yeah, you've got to be a little forceful sometimes. I was in court the other day with a fellow and he asked the judge, uh, uh, would it be all right with you if I read into the record and uh, demanded my rights? And the judge says, no, you're excused. You can leave now. Next case. A free man does not ask 
for permission to do anything. You think a king or a sovereign goes out and asks, well, would it be all right if I, if all the facts are in, maybe, and my theory is that I can do this or that? Poppycock. The next issue here is called a jurisdiction brief. So pick up your jurisdiction brief, memorandum of law in support of jurisdiction. And let's take a look at this document and let's see how this fits into the overall scheme of challenging the court's jurisdiction and establishing the jurisdiction of your own personal sovereignty. This brief, called the Jurisdiction Brief, Memorandum of Law in Support of Jurisdiction, is another supplement called Status to Contract. I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on this because I'm down to an hour of time, and there's two other briefs here called Equity and uh, Rights that I want to talk about in more detail and split up the time. Remember now, as you're going through this, we have literally, and I'm not exaggerating a bit, when I tell you I've got hundreds, of briefs, affidavits, position papers, books, articles, etc. I could be here preaching sermons to you people out there for the next 10,000 hours, and I still don't know if I'd cover all of the information that we've amassed here at Orson's Inn of Bear Street. Now, <clears throat> the purpose of the course, which we call this law course, is to teach you constitutional law and its application in that courtroom and on that courtroom floor. This is knowledge that's absolutely vital and absolutely necessary for you to walk in on that courtroom floor like a lion instead of a mouse. As I just related to you, this poor fellow goes in and asks the judge, well, uh, if it pleased the court, and yes, sir, and no, sir, and may I please, if it doesn't interrupt your procedure here, uh, uh, read my rights onto the record. That's poppycock and baloney. You walk in there like that, you're walking in there like Toby the slave, not like the free man who is the sovereign. Sovereigns act like sovereigns, and slaves act like slaves. The courts are in there to adjudicate issues, and issues have to be adjudicated between two contentious parties like this. you got loggerheads. you got two people in here that are angry with one another. And this is an adversary circumstance, and that judge is a referee. Don't walk in there and ask him for permission. That's my courtroom in there. So on this subject matter of this jurisdiction brief, this is an additive then to the subject matter of status, and it's got some more <clears throat> nifty little items in it, some more common law actions and dictionary definitions and etc. And you need to read it, and you need to become familiar with it, and you need to understand it, and it's a supplement to the subject matter called status, and you need to take a look at Bouvier's Law Dictionary. And understand that thing of status, because you know if you're right, if you're driving down the road with a driver's license in your back pocket, don't sit there and get mad with the regulator. I mean, after all, a policeman's got a job to do, and his job is to regulate trade, commerce, business, and industry, and he's hired to do that job, and you've got the driver's license. You, you're like Colonnade Catering Corporation or the Biswell Corporation. And that's all there is to it. Now, it doesn't mean you can't go in the courtroom and argue and win. I mean, you know, certainly you can go in there and argue a procedure and win. You can demand 15 rights, and they can only produce 10 of them, and so therefore you're going to win on those five. But we would like to see citizens who straighten out their status and become responsible once again and stop paying the income tax because they don't owe the income tax. Now I want to talk about this thing called rights. <clears throat> this is the thicker one. It's a bigger document. It's jurisdiction in support of rights. So I'm going to hold this up on the screen so that you can see the one that we're looking at. And I want to comment also while my cameraman here is focusing in on this. This paper that I'm reading from here was filed in that criminal case number that you're looking at right up there. That was a felony. These people wanted to put me in the penitentiary for 14 years, and I argued this position on the courtroom floor, and at the first motion hearing, the case was dismissed on the initiative of the prosecutor. That's right. First motion hearing, the prosecutor dismissed. I can sit there and say, well, gosh, why did he dismiss? I don't know why. I had 34 motions in. Could it have been this jurisdiction argument that the government didn't want to face? Was it the council issue the government didn't want to face? Was it the common law jury issue? Was it the uh, uh, 
the issues of the right sui uh who knows what issue it was. I can't tell you why they dismissed. All I know is that I had 34 federal questions called major federal questions, and they decided that they couldn't overcome all 34, so maybe what we better do is just leave in disgrace rather than in absolute defeat. Well, let's take a look here at the jurisdictional brief, rights in support of demand for dismissal. Now, here I am demanding dismissal because this court doesn't have jurisdiction over me. And a court that doesn't have jurisdiction, friend, can't convict you of a crime unless you give them your permission, unless you consent to it. And friends, I'm just not consenting to my government throwing me out here in the federal pen or out here in the state pen for 14 years. Article 1, Section 3, Page 1 of the Idaho State Constitution states, The state of Idaho is an inseparable part of the American Union, and the Constitution of the United States is the supreme law of the land. And I don't know how your Constitution reads where you are, friend, but... In Idaho, we've stipulated that the Constitution of Idaho is subservient to, it's a lesser document than our federal Constitution and recognizes it. And so the two Constitutions go together just like that, two peas in a pod. The Constitution of the United States states that this Constitution shall be the supreme law of the land and the judges in every state shall be bound thereby. So I'm going to argue the supremacy clause. I'm saying, Judge, you are absolutely duty-bound to these constitutional documents. And Marbury v. Madison in 1803 says that constitutions are superior law. They're not average, run-of-the-mill statutes. They are superior. There can be no doubt that all judges are bound by the Constitution of the United States, which is a part of the common law, which nullifies any legislative law or statute that violates the rights of a free man. Yeah, when it violates the rights of the free man, it's null and void. If it violates the, um, the, the imagined rights of a slave, then it's something else again. You see why you're having so much problem in these courts? People are going in there as members and subjects who have volunteered into a regulated enterprise. I've got to stop here for a moment, and I've got to tell you a little story, because if you don't, you're going to get bored to tears, and you won't like to watch the rest of me here. Do you remember reading in the newspaper about these ladies in Cook County in Chicago and how the police stopped them on these traffic infractions and violations and then arrest them and take them off to jail and subject them to strip searches? Remember, we just talked about Yick Woe versus Hopkins Sheriff and how the Supreme Court says, well, that's the very essence of slavery itself. I'll bet you every one of those ladies has a driver's license. I'll bet you every one of those ladies is driving a car that's registered. Now, I know what you're going to say is, if I don't have the driver's license, registration, and proof of insurance, they're going to throw me in jail. Well, they're throwing those ladies in jail, and they do have the registration, driver's license, and proof of insurance. Does that tell you you're living in a police state tyranny? Does that tell you that those ladies had better get control of their government there in Chicago? That's what it tells me. But you see, they volunteered into that regulated enterprise, and so now the police state comes down on them voluntarily. Just like the two men I told you about earlier that went into the courtroom and they sat there, and for 30 minutes they had to explain to the judge why he had jurisdiction, how they got it, how they committed the burglary, why they committed the burglary, and what the burglary meant, and what the penalty was, and so that they could give the judge permission to sentence them to the state penitentiary. That's right. And that's what all the rest of us have done. You have to sign contracts. You know, <clears throat> you were born free, you had your freedom, and it required effort on your part to get rid of your freedom because your Constitution will not allow you to give up your freedom unless you'll not only do it voluntarily, but you've got to sign a contract to do it. In the state of Idaho, you can't plead guilty and go to the penitentiary unless you can explain to the judge how he has the authority and the power to put you out there. I know that sounds crazy, friends, but that's the way the law is. And I didn't write it, so don't get mad at me. The Idaho, down at the bottom of page one, now let's pick up there. The Idaho Code of Criminal Procedure, Rule 12a, states that all other pleas and demurs and motions to quash are abolished. And the defenses and objections raised before trial, which heretofore could have been raised by one or more of them, shall be raised only by a motion to dismiss or to grant appropriate relief as provided in these rules. 
this person contends that this change in procedure by the courts is a violation of right. If a person once had the right to appear by special appearance, they now have the same right. And for the courts to attempt to take away said right is nothing more than an arbitrary act that is null and void, because an unconstitutional act isn't law. It confers from a case called Norton v. Shelby County. Norton v. Shelby County is an old-timey case decided about 1885, I believe it was. I'm sorry, I don't have the citation in here. But that Norton v. Shelby County is going to be picked up, and we'll pick up a quotation on it later. In fact, you may even have that case in one of those Supreme Court reports. It's a collateral matter at this point in time. But I want to point out something here, too, you need to understand. The courts aren't totally to blame here for this, this change in the status of citizens from their natural and alienable rights to uh, contract. You know, we go to school, and we're taught that corporate structure and corporate status is the way to go. I know I formed a corporation. I had no more reason to do that, or I didn't know and understand what I was doing. My lawyer just told me that's the way business is done. And I thought, oh, gee, I guess if that's the way business is done, where do I sign? And I got my pen out, and I signed all the confessions and admissions and sold myself into serfdom. Nobody explained this to me. Had they explained it to me, I'd have said, wait a minute, I'm not going to give up my rights. Why don't I operate as a sole proprietor? Well, because then you'd be responsible for your actions, you see. And if you were responsible for your actions, well, then people could sue you. This way, they have to sue the corporation, and the corporation, you see, is the shield between you and the person suing you. Okay, and that sounded good to me. That sounded like a license to steal, and I wanted the license to steal. I didn't want the responsibility. Well, the courts then, when they're drawing up rules of procedure, they haven't had a free man come through their courts in the state of Idaho who has demanded a grand jury in 18 years. 